Hey. Got announcements everywhere. I don't know if I can even if I know where they're all at. I lost. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Angela gave me some announcements about the I got sweatshirts. Here, you no, 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 no. It was uh so let me double check. Ask her to write it out for me again. All right, good morning to church. Uh, if you'd all stand and turn over to page 38, uh, Dennis is going to lead us. Uh... Page, page 38, 1 and 4. Everybody sing loud because I'm not a great singer. Okay, Christy. <laughs> Please remain standing for opening prayer. A couple of announcements before we open with prayer. Joanne Hansen is in the hospital. She is uh, uh, she has pneumonia and uh, not doing. Uh, she's doing okay, I guess. Hopefully, she'll come home this weekend. But if you get a chance, stop up the Rapids Hospital, see her. Um, Todd's been up there, Penny, so and her daughter Tammy also. But uh, please pray for uh, Joanne. Myron's here today, doing well. So. Uh, Probably should leave him on the list because he's, I guess, uh, been being kicked when he's down. He's, no, I'm just kidding. Something between me and him. So he's doing excellent. So answered prayer there, and we just want to thank God for that. Buddy, uh, we want to continue for Buddy for uh, personal there. And Chris Brown, he was back in the hospital for his uh, thyroid surgery, but I think he's home now doing well. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. So we'll keep Chris, Chris on the list. Neil Hoppola. Um, my parents and myself and my sister, we would go to Deer Lake up in Effie. We used to camp with uh, the Hynix and some of the Lunds up there. And, and uh, anyways, Neil Hoppola was about 41, and he died of a heroin overdose. And um, just this last Sunday, I got an email or a text. And so we need to pray for the Hoppola family. I know the funeral's here in a week. So just pray for that family for gospel to be given. And then we had another tragedy in the community years, a young man named Jaden Gangle. And we do have uh, family members that do attend the church here. And my uh, deepest sympathy and you know, sorrows go out, go out for the family. And we just want to pray for, um, you know, the gospel's been given at his funeral. His funeral's today at 2 o'clock uh, at the Catholic Church in Coleraine. So um, just need to pray for that family. 
he hung himself, so, and dad found him. So, I mean, that's public information, so we just need to pray for dad for sure. We need to pray for Chrissy Schmidt. Chrissy is, uh, she lost her husband uh, a couple Sundays ago, and just need to pray for that family also, going through some trials. And then our brother Danny, we got some, uh, we want to pray for Danny, Danny Nix, that uh, we have answered prayer at the end of the month here that uh, cancer's in remission, the bone cancer. And we pray for Pastor Tom this week. When you say your prayers, that his medical uh, appointment goes well. They're driving down Tuesday night, and they will have this procedure. He will have the procedure <clears throat> Wednesday. And then Big Dan, I don't see Big Dan. Um, he's got some medical stuff going on, so if you pray for Big Dan also. But these are some of the things uh, we want to pray for this week. Is there any other prayer requests this, this morning? <clears throat> yes. I added her to the list last week, but what was her, uh, her name again? The Hood. She lost one of her friends. Her brother. Uh, I'm sorry. Fred? If you didn't hear that, Marie had passed away of one of somebody that Freddie knows, Fred Grossman, and Fred will be doing part of the funeral service. So we definitely want to pray for that. We know the gospel will be shared there. So hopefully, pray for people to be hearing this. So if there's no other prayer requests this morning, we'll open with prayer. Now, dear Heavenly Father, Father, first of all, we just we want to thank you for your grace. We can stand here today and we don't gather to glorify man. We don't stand up here and we don't want the recognition, nor do we deserve the recognition, but we gather here in your name, Father. It is by grace that we can gather here today because we know that we deserve hell. There is not one good man, not good one good woman that deserves to go to heaven. I don't care what they've done. It doesn't matter if they're religious. Just because you're religious doesn't mean you're righteous. And Father, we just don't want to, again, want to thank you for your grace. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. It is the greatest gift that we can spend eternity. You you demand perfection to get into heaven. You demand a, a death payment for sin. But you provide that perfection in Jesus Christ, and you provide that substitutionary payment in Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for this the greatest gift, the gift of eternal life, when we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And we thank you for grace, because that is who you are and it's what you're about. If people don't truly understand grace, you know, that is the character of God. And we just, again, want to thank you for your grace, that you love those sinners, that you sent your only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. And when we believe that, we receive eternal life. We're born again, regenerated, born from above, receiving the Holy Spirit of promise, sealed in, the, you know, in Christ's hands and in the Father's hands, becoming holy. And we thank you for that great gift there, Father. And Father, as we gather here in your name and give glory to you, we have, as we walk in this life here, Father, we just have so many trials and tribulations, and we know that all trials are to give glory to you. So Father, we just ask through the trials and tribulations that we're going through in our life that we would pray that the gospel is to be shared. If it's a medical procedure or if it's, you know, we're going attending, that Father, we just pray that you would open doors that you would open doors. We don't go to offend, but we go in that, Father, we would ask that you would open doors, that people would approach us, and that we would, could share the, share the gospel, that we could bold and let people know exactly that where they stand and that they have a Savior, and it is blood, by the blood of the Lamb that they can be saved, that they're sitting here today with their sins paid for, that the funerals that we attend this week, that we can let the people know that their sins are paid for and all they have to do is believe. That's all that you require from us. And we thank you for that, Father. And Father, we just pray for a few individuals this week. You know, we can't mention everybody, and we just, we just want to ask that the people would remember all the people in prayers this week here, and that they would continue to pray for the family here, Father. But we want to pray for Joanne. Pray for our sister that you would take care of her there, Father. She's had a lot going on in her life, and 
from losing a grandson to then losing a son and then losing her husband and now in the hospital herself. So, Father, we just pray that you'd comfort her and give her peace, and we know that she leans on those everlasting arms, and she finds comfort in the Word of God, and she just loves when we pray. So, Father, we would just ask that you'd bring people out, and that they would pray together, and that she could find comfort in your words there, Father. And we pray for Pastor Tom with his medical procedure this week. We pray that you'd deliver him through this, and that you would... Uh, uh, make him better through it there, Father. We pray for Denny Nix, that we pray for the cancer to be in remission, like Willie there. We thank God, praise God, for Willie being in his cancers in remission. We thank you for that, and we pray for the same for Denny. We just pray for that uh, you'd be with uh, Mary Lou Hood this week. It's got to be a tragic thing to lose a sister or brother, and we just ask that you'd be with uh, her there, Father, and be with the family. And we also pray for the Hopala family, to losing a son, a grandson, a friend, a brother, I don't know, so many people, but Father, we just pray that a clear gospel be given at Neil's funeral there, Father. And we pray for Jaden Gangle, a young man there, Father, just a tragic situation, 19 years old. We just pray that you'd be with the family there, that uh, they could find comfort in your words, and we just pray that, Father, that you would open doors, that the people would be open to hearing a gospel or sharing and that you would use this church here and that you'd use the people and that they could go and comfort and show comfort to that family and, and um, just support that family through this trial, their Father. So, Father, we just ask that you'd be with us today and bless the word to our body in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, before uh, birthdays, I just want to let everybody know that uh, we got the manor house today. If anybody wants to come out and help us, uh, they're more than welcome. And we got the sturgeon fishing trip in the back. It's May 5th. So if anybody wants to go or if you know somebody that wants to go, you know, we're going to have a short message right after breakfast. If Lance is there, he'll have it. If not, me or one of the men of the church. But uh, we, got, we got that going on and... Uh, Tell somebody about it. And today at the Manor House, we definitely need help if, uh, if somebody wants to come. Uh, how about birthdays? Oh, we got one right in the front here. Two in the front. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Any anniversaries? Thank you. <laughs> okay, how about page 108? Uh, verses, let me see. All three. <coughs>
to sing all of them. Some of you are probably thinking, yeah, get the kids up there so we can get out of there before 10.30. <laughs> Last week was a little late, so I apologize. A couple of announcements here. We've got a couple meetings right after church today. Looks like the women's meeting right after church today uh, for the Duluth trip next Saturday, the 22nd, Sisters in Service. We'll have that meeting downstairs. I, I need an uh, emergency board meeting. Uh, with the board and board of trustees after in this meeting here. Camp meeting was going to be after, um, but I think I might uh, postpone the camp meeting until next week. Yeah, we need a couple other things to work out first. Looks like uh, a couple announcements for sweatshirts. The last day to order Lord's Army sweatshirts, adult hoodies and zip up, $25. A adult crew, 20 and kids crew are 15 Please get with Angela. Angela, raise your arm. So that's, uh, we got the black uh, Lord's Army uh, sweatshirts um, and hoodies that she'll be ordering for that. So again, sisters in service, if you want to be part of that, we have a van. Rachel, meet downstairs, and uh, Rachel, Chris, kind of head that meeting up, and, and uh, well, whoever, yeah. We'll head up the meeting and make sure they'll get the details there. Mostly Rachel, all right. I'm going to keep announcements short. You can check out for yourself. But uh, Bible study this Wednesday, I encourage people to come out. It's always a good time. We had a good discussion Wednesday. and Again, very knowledgeable, very knowledgeable individuals, and it's a good time. Um, great place to continue to grow and learn the Word of God. And the Men of God Conference is coming up March 28th and 29th. I got five people signed up from the church already. Anthony's coming up. He's going to drive up, stay at my house Friday night, and we're going to drive down Saturday. I got a couple guys coming from work. So I'm hoping we can uh, have a good showing. So if you want to go, email me. Um, we'll meet in Hibbing Friday night, or you can just drive down, and then we'll drive back. And then if we have to, we could take the van on Saturday if we have that many people. Um, but uh, it's going to be a good time. And there's nothing better than men, you know, uh, growing together in the Word of God. Because that's, that's, what that's what being a man is about. Um, I don't care what the world says. <clears throat> We're going to keep the announcement short. So is there anything else? Yes, Willie.
If you have something you want to donate to the to uh, the auction, the youth group auction, which donates a lot of money, revenues uh, should generate a lot of revenue for the Bible camp. Talk to Willie and Ron Hines. So auction and uh, it's been kind of Willie's uh, passion and Ron Hines' passion. So um, you can start bringing uh, things to the church if you want for the auction. All right, no other announcements. We'll do. I think I got all the announcements, right? Okay. Uh, let's have all the kids up here. That's all right. Do Lord, if you know the song, Do Lord, you know the first verse. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Second verse, I took Jesus as my Savior. Third verse, David was a small arms expert. Well, we could ask Grandpa if she sings loud. Come on up here. Who else needs a handout? Nothing. Nope, Hayden does not. Nope, everybody knows it. Anybody else want a handout? Okay, you all must know it. Here we go. You want me to hold you? Here we go. Lots of kids, growing church. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Look away beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do it for me. Do Choice of music this week. Thanks, Christy. Eddie, thank you. Yeah, we can get encouragement from our kids, that's for sure. 
Uh, if you don't know Timmy, where's Timmy at? Timmy H, where you at, buddy? There he is. Raise your hands so everybody can see Timmy. Yeah, one of my good friends. So he is a good friend of mine. Uh, he picked up 20, 20 tracks last week, and he said he handed them out. And I'm like, wow. I mean, I didn't hand out 20 tracks this week. And I wonder how many adults handed out 20 tracks. Um, Timmy, you keep it up. Keep handing out those tracks. If you turn over to Phil Philippians, Philippians 1. All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for thank you for sending your only begotten Son. Thank you for having your Son die for me. Thanking, thanking, thank you for having your Son resurrect for me, showing us the payment for sins has been paid in full. And thank you for allowing me to spend eternity with you for not anything that I've done, but because of everything that you and your Son has done. It is just an honor to stand up here and to share the wonderful words of life with people. And Father, we just ask that you'd use the words today that people would know exactly where they're at. If somebody's sitting here today and they have no idea where they're going, maybe they think they're good enough, maybe they're trusting in their works, maybe they're trusting in their baptism, maybe they're trusting in confessing their sins, maybe they're conf trusting in becoming a church member. We know the Word of God is clear that none of those things will save you, and if people are trusting in their works or some sacrament or some ritual, they, we know they will go to hell. It is the Word of God that is very clear to let us know that we're saved by the blood of the Lamb, that is what Jesus Christ has done. So, Father, we just ask that you use the words today that people would know exactly where they stand, and we hope that people would receive Christ as their Savior today. And, Father, we just ask that you'd use the word today to... Speak to all the believers here that they would continue to grow up in Christ and ultimately have the mind of Christ. That is the goal. So, Father, we just ask that you would feed the sheep today through the words, and I would just be the, the broken vessel that you're using, and I thank you for that, Father. So please bless the word today in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Philippians 1.23. You probably thought I was going to say 121, but 121 is great. It says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I tell you what, as a believer like Terry Hansen was, uh, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And I tell you what, if you're reading the word of God, there is a life far better than this life. And that is what Philippians 21, Paul is saying, for me to live is Christ. He suffered for Christ. He was persecuted. There's going to be trials and tribulations. But when you die, to die is gain. It is a graduation unto eternal life eternal life that we have right now, but it's graduation unto the Father and the presence of Him for all eternity. And, and to die is gain. But that's not the verse I want to talk about. I want to talk about 23. It says, For I am in a, in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. See, Paul's attitude was he wanted to depart, but he knew he had to stay. And at times I know I want to depart. And I know there's believers here that they probably feel the same. But I want to focus on the last part of that, the latter part of the verse. It says, which is far better. Desire to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. <clears throat> as a believer, as a believer in Christ, the words far better are comforting to hear from the lips of God himself. To a non-believer, this might sound like nonsense. To a carnal Christian, this might even sound like nonsense. But I want to speak to the non-believers here today, if there's any non-believers here today. Somebody who has not trusted Christ as their Savior. Someone who does not believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins. To a non-believer, this life is as good as it gets. To a non-believer, this life is as good as it gets. And the life hereafter is far worse for if you do not believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. You are eternally separated from God himself and will ever pay, forever pay for your sins in all eternity, suffering forever in torment where the worm never dieth. And I believe that worm that never dieth is your conscience, that you 
will forever suffer in hell, remembering that you had a Savior and you rejected him. That's not biblical, but I think that's what the worm never dieth means. From the second one is conceived. The process of life will end in death, and we have individuals that grow up and spend their entire life focused on fleshly items. Eyes and mind are focused on the precious items of the world. And if you don't believe in Christ, this life is as good as it gets. And the attitude of ink and drink and party today for tomorrow, nobody knows what will happen. This is a lie that Satan wants you to believe. Wants you to believe you are your own God and ink and eat and drink and party for today. For tomorrow, nobody knows what will happen. And I tell you what, isn't that the attitude of the world today? We have the written words of God right here telling us, desire to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. There's a life after physical death, and if you put your trust and faith in the works of Jesus Christ, you believe Christ Jesus paid the debt of sin you owed, life here on earth is not the best. Actually, believers have something far better waiting for them. To a non-believer, do you really find joy in this world? At times, sinning can be fun. At times, sinning can be fun. But the consequences of sin will bring death. And I, and, we, and I always talk about it is not always a physical death. It will bring death to a job, death to a family, death to self. And I tell you what, that's exactly what Satan wants. He wants kids to start smoking marijuana, dope, and drinking alcohol at a young age so they can grow up using other drugs so eventually they can overdose. It's what he wants. Satan wants kids to grow up not hearing the gospel and the doomsday, the doomsday of reality of the world start to weigh on the kid. You don't think the kids are troubled by what's happening in the world today? Then, then they make a decision that they can't do it and end up taking their own life. I'm telling you, it's what Satan wants. See, if you're a non-believer, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior and you are happy with people dying around you with cancer, happy with people dying in car accidents, happening with wars of the world and women and children being raped and murdered daily, if you're happy with kids killing themselves, if you're happy with young men and women killing themselves daily with drugs and alcohol, And I'm speaking to the non-believer here. Keep rejecting the redemptive works of Jesus Christ because this is list life is as good as it gets. I'm not saying that believers don't struggle with those things because they do. But again, I'm talking to the non-believer, somebody that has not trusted Christ as their Savior. And maybe the non-believer you're sitting here today blaming God for all the misery around you in your life. And I would say God has big shoulders and he could take all the blame you can give him. However... You're focusing on the, your anger and focusing your blame on the wrong object. The one you should be bitter with, the one you should be disgusted with, the one you should truly hate is Satan. See, Satan comes to steal. Turn to John chapter 10. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And like I said earlier, sometimes sinning is fun. It looks like fun. But I'm telling you, the consequences will always bring misery and death to whatever that is. So many young men that are athletes will go to college and get this in the pros, and then they obviously get all this money, and then we see what happens to them. And they're penniless within years. And the consequences of having eight different children with eight different women is is tremendous, and we see this with running backs today in, in the NFL and, and professional players, and, you know, and it, it, again, at time, when you're in it, it probably is like, oh, this is fun. But I can't stress enough the consequences of sin are destructive. See, Satan in 10.10, 10, he says, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what Satan has to offer. This is exactly what he's doing to our kids, to our young men and women, and to our families, to our communities. See, what people don't realize is Jesus Christ comes to give life, eternal life, to the sinner who deserves death. 
He doesn't just give you life. He comes to give you life more abundantly. And it took me a long time to figure that out. For I did some of those things we talked about earlier. I was saved. I can't lose my salvation. But as a born again, as a believer, I'll tell you what, I was pretty miserable. And when I found I got myself in the Word of God, I tell you what, my relationship with my wife has been nothing but better. My relationship with my son and daughter has been nothing better. And I wouldn't change it for nothing, the wonderful words of life, the time that I get to spend with God reading His Word. See, He comes to give you life, but He comes to give you life more abundantly. Yet we have individuals that hate Christ and they're enemies of the cross, which is really sad. See, let's read the rest part of that verse. It's come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. See, what they, and when I say they, the non-believers fail to realize is Christ Jesus loved them before they were even born. What they fail to realize is that Christ Jesus has already died for them and their sins are already paid for. All their sins are completely paid for. All their past, present, and future sins paid for, paid in full. The debt of payment for sin has been finished. 1 John 2, 2 and 2, 12 says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you and for his, for his name's sake. John 19, 30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he says, It is finished bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Are you happy with people dying around you with cancer? Are you happy with people? Because this life is as good as it gets for a non-believer. And I want people to wake up their eyes, open their eyes, and see what's happening around them. Happy with people dying in cocks, happy with wars and women and children be raped and murdered. Happy with kids killing themselves. Happy with young men and women killing themselves daily. And I would say keep rejecting the works of God. Keep rejecting the, the redemptive works of Jesus Christ. Because this life is as good as it gets. Now if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired and realize you want something far better, why not trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today? Because I'm telling you, I've been trained in a lot of cognitive behavioral theories and things like that. And there's only one change agent that works. And it's the Holy Spirit. It's believed that Christ died on the cross for your sins. And when you get the Holy Spirit, that is the only change agent that works in people's lives. Why not trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today? And let me, let me be real clear because one cannot be too clear on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not confessing one's sins. And we have evangelical churches today that say, just confess, just repent, just turn, ask Jesus in your heart, and it's a bunch of garbage. It's not biblical. Making Jesus Lord of your life. We'll see evangelicals do that. It's not doing good deeds. It's not being baptized. not being a member of a particular religion, organization. Let me be real clear. Everyone is not going to heaven. God provided a way for everyone to go to heaven. But if you reject the path God provided, you will go to hell. Remember last week we talked about having a circumcised heart. One must be born again, regenerated. One must believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins. An individual saved by grace. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. It means you can never earn it. Salvation is a free gift, freely received in Jesus Christ. And we all know this. Most of us do. Are we sharing it with people? An individual saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We need to be more like Timmy and handing out 20 tracks a week. Because kids are dying out there. Where is the object of that faith? Let me ask you this. If you're sitting here today and you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you're like, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and I was baptized. Well, let me, let's be real clear. And I'm going to say, where is the object of that faith? Are you focusing on your good deeds or some sacrament you have done in your life 
for example, baptism, communion, confirmation to save you, or have you trusted in the redemptive works of Jesus Christ? Faith is like a spotlight, and if you have that spotlight, and if that spotlight is not completely focused on what Jesus Christ, you're not saved. If you believe, you have to keep believing. And there's people that say, oh, I believe, but you must keep believing. Well, then you never really trusted in Jesus Christ. You're never really, really born again because it's a one-time act. It's not believe and keep believing. Well, then I'm doing something. No longer is the spotlight on Jesus Christ. The spotlight is on me keeping my salvation, me believing. and never really trusted in what he did for me. The spotlight is focused on you, and I would say you have not completely trusted in Christ as your Savior because you're not, you are doing something. If you believe one has to believe and be baptized, the spotlight is focused on you. Can you see how that works? If you take any of that focus off Jesus Christ and you start to add yourself just creeping in a little bit, then you, that's not the gospel, folks. It is a one-time act. Believe one time in the works of Jesus Christ. Believe he died on the cross for your sins and you're born again. You are saved. It is once saved, always saved which is biblical, because eternal life means once saved is always saved. Adopted into God's family, will forever be his son, daughter. We live because Christ Jesus lives. We're hid in Christ, Colossians 3.3 tells us. Now you know what the gospel is not. Why not believe what Jesus has done for you already? Why not have God put Christ's death Put to your account by faith and be born again. Be born again right here, right now, where you sit. Why not look forward to the life far better that is in Christ Jesus who comes to give life, abundant life and eternal life. Receive it right now. Turn over to Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 14. See, the believer is complete in Christ. And verse 9 tells us, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. He is fully God and fully man. The deity is in Jesus Christ. He left his glorification, but he didn't leave his deity. He cannot leave his deity because that's who he is. He's God. And you are complete in him. See, we're complete in Christ. We're not adding anything to that which is the head of the principality and the power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. See, it went, goes really good with Romans 2.28 there. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. See, our sins are paid for. We died with him. When we accept Christ as our Savior, it was like we were co-participants at the cross, it was like me dying for my sins and me raising for my sins. I am in Christ. It was like I was there who hath raised him from the dead and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he, Christ, quickened. Quickened means made alive together with him. See, we're alive in Christ and if you're not in Christ, you're not alive. You're a trespasser. Having forgiven you all trespasses, A-L-L, -L. it's not an italicized, it is in the original text, all past, present, future sins paid for. He's forgiven you all, you're sitting here with your sins paid for if you have not trusted Christ as your Savior. 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. They're removed as far as the east is from the west, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to the cross, figuratively and spiritually. And I don't know how people can mess it up. But let this hand here represent you and I, and this here hand here represents our sin. See, God loves us, hates our sin. If you're sitting here today, and you're not trusted Christ as your Savior, your sin is still put to your account. And if you try to cover that sin up by maybe confessing that sin, or turning from that sin, or trying to get baptized... The Bible is very clear, folks. Payment for sin is a death payment. If you want to pay for your sin, if you want to reject the redemptive works of Jesus Christ, you want to reject that, you will go to hell and pay for your sin for all eternity. You will go to hell and pay for it for all eternity. Why for all eternity? Because you can never make a perfect sacrifice. Never make a perfect sacrifice. Let this hand here represent Jesus Christ. 
perfect, the lamb that was sent to slaughter, obviously the lamb that revealed himself as a man, God from eternity past, Jesus Christ. And he went to the cross, and he shed his blood, and he died for me, and he died for you, and he rose for you, and he rose for me. And you're sitting here with your sins paid for. He had paid for all. And to receive this righteousness that is required to go to heaven, the righteousness in Christ, all one has to do is believe. To have that death payment put to your account is believe. Say, I, Father, I believe that. I believe that Christ died on the cross for my sins. And that death payment was put to your account. And you're as seen in Christ, hid in Christ, seen as perfect as Christ. Now hopefully you have accepted Christ as your Savior. If not, this life is as good as it gets. I tell you what, it can be pretty hopeless. I tell you what, when I, now I'm saved, and I know there's a life far better. Man, that's, that's exciting. And the rapture could happen even today. That's exciting. To know that I will spend eternity in heaven is a wonderful thing to know. And you can know it. Let's turn over to Romans. We're currently studying Romans and have studied the immoral sinner, the moral sinner, and the religious sinner. See, God is speaking to believers, and we will encounter these individuals. God, Romans, Paul is speaking to believers, and right now we're talking about the lost, people that are not saved. And when you spread the gospel, you will encounter one of these three groups. You'll encounter the immoral sinner, the moral sinner, and obviously the religious sinner. Anyone you spread the gospel to will fall into the category of those three. They're all sinners, and they need a great Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, you should be not be listening to this part of the message. For this is to the believer in Christ, which the book of Romans is written for. Again, speaking to the believers about the lost person, three categories, the lost of lost. And the last category we're focusing on and the, spend the most emphasis on is the religious sinner. And remember, religion, religious does not make you righteous. We talked about that last week. So Romans 3.1 one says, What advantage then hath the Jew? And whenever you see, you could see Jew here, you could probably put in the religious person. What advantage, what advantage then hath the Jew or religious person? What profit is there of circumcision? See, Paul asked the question about the Jew, and we can say a religious person. We found out in chapter 2 that committing a religious act in chapter 2, for example, circumcision does not save a person because one must be circumcised of the heart. It's not about what we do physically. We worship God in spirit. It's about do you reject him or receive him? And after you receive him, then it's about continuing to serve him. It's about where your mind is at. So just like water baptism doesn't save, uh, one must be baptized by the spirit. And for one to be baptized by the spirit and for one to be circumcised of the heart, one must believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. So the question is, what advantage then does have the Jew and a religious person? The answer is in verse 2. It says, much every way, chiefly because that under them there are committed the oracles of God. See, the advantages to the Jew and to the religious person is that they have the written words of God. There's probably not a home in the United States that doesn't have a Bible, or not a person in the United States that has not had contact with the Bible. And yet people continue to reject the redemptive works of Jesus Christ. The Jew and a religious person has the advantage because one can look at the wonderful words of life and find out for themselves they're a sinner and need a great Savior. Verse, well, I'm not going to go there yet, but I just had, we now have three witnesses that testify against the immoral and moral and the religious sinner. To the immoral sinner, God has put it in all of us. There is something greater and revealed there is something greater to the moral sinner through his creation. So we'll review here for the immoral sinner. Look at Romans 1, 19 and 20. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. So there will be no excuse. No excuse. For God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. 
being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. To the moral sinner, God has shown to them they are no better than the moral sinner, but he has revealed it to them in their conscience. When the moral sinner is accusing or excusing others because of what they're doing, it is revealed in their conscience they are no better. Look at Romans 2.15 which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one or another. And now to the religious sinner today, God has shown them they are no better, for they have the scriptures to show that they're a sinner also, and that God will not accept man's work for salvation. God will not accept man's efforts or merits for payment for sin. For example... What, we're, what religious people do is they trust in circumcision, baptism, communion, confirmation, some type of sacrament. Romans 3, 2 says much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So there will be no excuse when you stand in front of God if, you're, if the lost person's an immoral or moral or religious sinner. So remember, the only remedy for sin is the blood of the Lamb. Then I wrote down here, 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. It says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We go on to Romans 3, 3. So he asks another question. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? We've run into this a lot. When I was going to the jail with Herman, I run into this a lot. It's a great question, and do we not encounter this same mentality today? Yeah, we do. People will say, I have my own God. I have the woods, I have Mother Earth, I have the bottle, I have these pills, I have the money, I have Allah, I have my women, I have my works, whatever their God is. Some have a universe attitude, as lately as the Pope has said. doesn't matter what you believe in, as long as you're doing something good, you'll get there someday. Sounds all nice, but it's blah, blah, blah. It's tickling of the ears. The question is, just because you don't believe Christ Jesus as your Savior, just because you don't believe in the rem remedy of the blood of the Lamb, does it make it none effect? That is the question. And the answer is in verse 4. It says, God forbid you. God forbid, yes, let God be true, that, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Absolutely not. God forbid. God is true and every man a liar. God will keep his promise because this is who he is. He is a holy God. God is just when he speaks because this is who he is. He is a holy God. God is blameless when he judges because this is who he is. He is a holy God. Haven't we heard people today? She was a nice old lady. I know she didn't believe. She was very religious. She gave a lot of money. And I know she didn't believe in the gospel. How could God judge her? If there, there's not a God, if he could judge that little old lady... We hear that. I've heard that before. It doesn't matter if you're old or in your 20s and 30s. He is just. And if you make the decision to reject the redemptive works of Jesus Christ, God will let you go to hell. Isaiah 6, 3, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. He is holy in everything he does. And that's what verse 4 is talking about. In his justification, in his judging, he is holy. Romans 3, 5. And yet the lost, we see the same thinking with the lost today. And obviously God is preparing us for this mentality to combat. Romans 3, 5. But if our unrighteousness command the righteousness of God. So here, another question. And this is definitely the lost kind of raising these questions. But if our unrighteousness can demonstrate the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. Paul continues with question and answers and presents another question, anticipating questions man will have. If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, is God unrighteous when he judges? 
Answers in verse 6, God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? Absolutely not. God is the promise keeper, not man. God is just when he speaks because this is who he is. He is a holy God. God is blameless when he judges because this is who he is. He is a holy God. What people fail to, fail to re realize is exactly what we talked about last week. What God demands, God provides. God demands perfection to enter into heaven. God demands anyone who has sinned deserves to die for that sin and be eternally separated from God. However, God is a loving God and God is a compassionate God. God provided a lamb, his son Jesus Christ, to become sin for us who knew no sin, to die for the sins of mankind, and God will accept his son's death payment for sin only. And when you believe this, God puts Christ's death payment to your account. And I would say, why not receive the perfection needed to go to heaven in Christ Jesus? Turn over to Colossians 1.20. Great verses to combat the mentality of some of this thinking. See, David was a small arms expert, and you can be one too. David slayed giants, Goliath. Tried to put on Saul's armor, but Saul's armor didn't fit, remember? Fell right down. What did he do? Obviously, he just went out the way he was dressed. Got five slings from the, 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 the stream that was nearby, and he slayed giants. It's the word of God that slays giants, folks. You can be a small arms expert. That's what this is all about. It's about coming here and getting tools for your toolbox. Getting ammunition for your, for your artillery. And these are great verses. Colossians 1, 20 through 22. He says, And having made peace through the blood of cross, and having made peace... See, you were enemies before. And when you're enemies, you don't have peace. And Christ is the one that's doing this. He's doing the reconciling. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. See, he's the one that does the saving. He's the one that brings the reconciliation. We're enemies to God He's the one that brings us into reconciliation, back into favor, back into relationship. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Wicked works. That's what God calls them. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body, this is the great here, in the body of his flesh, through death, to present you, us, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. See, that's what Christ does for us. He, prints, he presents us in him. When we're hid in him and we're in Christ, he presents us unblameable, unreprovable, and we are holy be, because he is holy. Colossians 3.3 3. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. Don't try and argue by our sin. We make God a righteous God. I can't believe there's individuals that would even have that argument, but there is. We make God, they think that we make God a just God. And I would say God was righteous and just before man came into the picture, and when man recognizes his sin, we can see the mercy and grace of God. God saves us from a hell we deserve to have, and we don't. Don't think of your sin does justice to God's righteousness. And don't think that God should not judge man because man brings out the righteousness of God. That is ridiculous in thinking. That just shows how proud man can be. 3.7 For if the truth of God hath more abundant through my lie unto his glory, yet why yet am I also judged as a sinner? It's exactly what we just talked about. Same type of thinking. Verse 8, and not rather as we be slanderously reported. Obviously, they're 
now they're going to attack the grace message here, these people, and, and not rather, as we believers be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that, may, that good may come, whose damnation is just. <coughs> there were some that were saying Paul was preaching a license to sin. They were saying that Paul was preaching, let us do evil that, may, that good may come of it. That's not what Paul preaches, and that's not what the grace message is about. Do we not hear the same message today about the grace message? People say grace preaches, message preaches a license to sin, and we hear from that. We hear of that from the legalists today. Let me be real clear. God is talking about the lost here. But let's for a second, let's talk about the saved child who has his has the same mentality. If you're saved and you want to continue with your earthly lifestyle and have no fellowship with God, you will not lose your salvation. But you will be chastised. You will miss out on the blessings God has for you every day for his children. You miss out on his rewards. And you will even could be called home early. If you don't think the Lord will call his children home early, you are highly mistaken because the Bible discusses the sin unto death in 1 John chapter 5. See, grace message does not preach a license to sin. The grace message shows us exactly what we are, sinners. It shows us exactly what we deserve, hell, and what Christ has done for us. The grace message, te the grace message teaches us to grow up in grace. And at times, if we rebel as children, it teaches us that we're disciplined by grace. As born-again believers, we should never have the attitude, I'm saved and now I can do whatever I want because you will be the most miserable person ever. There are believers that have this attitude. They are still saved. They're still saved, but they are miserable. They are unjoyful. It's hard to be around some of these individuals. They're resentful individuals. It's because they're not in fellowship. That's truly sad. Back to speaking about the lost person. Paul ends verse 8 with the worst damnation is just. Whose damnation is just? God is just in his condemnation to the lost who think they are doing good, a service by their unrighteousness, and if they do not change their mind about Christ their Savior, they will be condemned. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. See, here we go. Didn't we see this in chapter 2, verse 1? To the Jew or to the religious man, you are, you are no better than they. You may look religious. You may be one of the nicest persons that you have ever lived. You might be, do many nice things for kids and families. But here is the final verdict, like in the courtroom scene. You can see it when you read this. We see the lawyers giving their closing statements. God is telling us here that the entire world is guilty of sin. The entire world is guilty before God. God, in his infinite wisdom, does not stop here. He goes on to share the next eight verses, which we're going to read. And he uses the word of God. These are verses from the Old Testament. And he goes on to show the world that they're guilty of sin, to show man he's not righteous, to show man he's not just, to show man he's corrupt, show they are filthy, point out that even their inward is wicked, the mouth is a tomb, it's death, it's full of decay, they are evil, they know no peace. It does not matter who you are, what you've done, you're guilty before God. That's what he's telling us. And he goes on here, Romans 3, 10 through 12 are quotes from Ecclesiastes 7.20 and Psalm 14.1-3, and he says this, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that are understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of their way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Romans 3.13 is a quote from Psalms 5.9 and Psalms 1.43. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Psalms, or Romans 3.14 is from Psalms 10.7. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Verses 15 through 17 is Isaiah 59.7 and 8. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. Verse 18 is from Psalms 36, 1. 
There is no fear of God before the rise. Verse 19 and 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and that the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We just had the closing statement in this courtroom with Paul and this tremendous closing verdict here from the word of God. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Law was given to show the Jew or religious person they are a sinner. Law was given so every mouth will be stopped. There will be no ya buts when you stand in front of God if you reject the redemptive works. There will be no Oh, yeah, I was guilty of that. Oh, yeah, I was guilty of that. Law was given to show the world is guilty before God. God says, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. See, Romans declares the gospel that we're studying. Galatians defends the gospel. Let's turn over to Galatians 3.24, and we will close on this. And we're coming up to some of the best scripture. If the Bible ended right there, it would be pretty hopeless. But we get into some of the best scripture coming up there in Romans chapter 3. But I want to show you something, Galatians 3.24. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Why can't people get it? People are going to hell with their sins paid for, and that is a tragedy. And if I would say, if we had to end in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, I would say, sounds pretty hopeless, doesn't it? But the next part of chapter 3 is fantastic. The spotlight is placed on the righteousness of Jesus Christ and what he did for us, how, we become, how he became propitiation Propitiation. Maybe you should look that word up over this next week. That would be homework. Appropriate sacrifice for the sin of God so man could be saved. I tell you what, Romans 3 is the last part. It is awesome. Let's close. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we just want to thank you for Christ. I just want to thank you for eternal life for all those who believe. And Father, we just pray that uh, the people here today, maybe there is a non-believer here today that did not know where they were going or wasn't clear, but maybe hopefully today they could hear a clear message that they understand that they deserve hell. It doesn't matter what they do or what they've done, and if they're trusting in anything they're doing, they will go to hell but they're sitting here with the sins paid for. It is Jesus Christ that's done everything for them, and all they have to do is believe believe Christ died for them, and they're saved. And Father, we just ask that you'd work with the believers here. We know that uh, we have children, you know, babes in Christ and teenagers in Christ, and we have seniors in Christ here, and we just pray that you continue to work with the, the your children here, Father. You continue to work with me and and that you'd continue to give me knowledge and continue to give the people knowledge when they study the Word of God. But it's all about growing up in Christ. And Father, we have so many ministries within the church here. And I would ask that you bless them all. We know there are people praying for the Word of God to be shared. And we just ask that you bless those individuals. We know there are individuals that are out there sharing. Randy and Herman are going to the jail. Awesome ministry there. We got Dennis and and Jack are sharing the gospel with the nursing home there. We just ask that you continue to bless their ministry there, Father. We got the, the families with the youth group, and they continue to do a wonderful job there. We just ask that you continue to bless the ministry there. But we would ask that you keep us grounded, you keep us focused, because at times I know pride does set in. That we just pray that you would keep us on the mission, the mission of 
that is about you, the Word of God. That's what the mission's about. It's about sharing the gospel. So, Father, I would just ask that you keep the mission clear and that there are trials or tribulations coming upon us that we would sit and discuss and work things out. That's what we need to do because we need... Satan is on attack. So, Father, we just ask that you continue to bless the people here, bless uh, everything going on, and we pray for our sister Joanne who's at the hospital. Pray that people would go visit her, Father. Pray for our brother Denny that we want the cancer in remission. Pray for Pastor Tom that have a safe trip down Tuesday night and everything goes well Wednesday. We pray for the Gangle family. Just pray for his dad and his mom. That Father, we just pray for that whole family, that they're, they're going, the trials that they're going through. and We just pray that you'd comfort the family, that you'd give them peace. And Father, we pray that you'd open doors, that people would want to hear a gospel. And then when the, those doors open, that people are ready to share the gospel. Pray for the Hopala family. Again, that you'd bring godly men into their, to those families and to, to share the gospel there. So please bless the, bless the family and bring us all back next week where we can give glory to you. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. If you want, I'll stand. Page to 314. Way better than 1030. No. <laughs> oh, it's right here, Dennis. I got one here. The CD? Yeah, it's got the tape on it right here. Okay. Oh, I guess not. <laughs> oh, we'll find her. <laughs> Page 314. All of them?